you create integrated systems that mimic nature. Nature does not know a concept of waste. So we have to go to that way, because peak oil is running out. We need some way to have a sustainable source. Now, this is not just an idea. We actually uh, have done this already for more than 25 years, planting these sugar palms and having several cycles. So in this buffer zone where you have sugar palms that you can tap every day, that you can take 65 different products off, you can create income for the people while planting a very biodiverse system in the middle which creates stability, less diseases, less fire susceptibility, more absorption of carbon. It's also a little bit more difficult, but that investment pays itself back quite nicely, as we will see. So we started off with this grassland, and then planting the trees in there. And from this tree uh, tower that we built up here, we could then monitor what happened. So this was two years later. But now look, if you take the view from the tower, just at that area, this is what you see. So in the first years, you get jobs for local people, and they can grow crops between the trees. So now you see the bananas, the papayas, you see the pineapples, and at the same time the trees are growing. And now, in the following years, you get materials out of it, you get fuel and some energy out of it, and you create biodiversity, you stabilize water. And after eight years, we were able to show these results. The air temperature gone down 3 to 5 percent. We have actually now more than 30 percent increase in rainfall and we helped 3,000 people to jobs and permanent income from that totally lost area. So it's not bad to put in a complicated business model if you can recreate rain with that. Above the forest, the forest is cool, so clouds accumulate above it and the trees produce cloud condensation nuclei that induce rainfall. What you also get is that that rainfall is not just above that forest, it spreads around it. So the agricultural productivity around it also goes up. So the values should be taken in total. And only if local people benefit, then I can help orangutans and I can help the rest of the world. So I'd like to take you on the next part of my presentation. Let's look at things from the other side. Maybe this is your side? So, for example, orangutans and energy. What do they have to do with each other? Huh? Actually, a lot. Orangutans turn out to be so smart that they are the most energy efficient beings in the world. Simply by using their heads. Because without know-how, without careful planning, taking into account all the aspects, you're not going to get very far. You're not going to last very long. Suppose you were that orangutan there. You have to think, huh? where are the fruit trees that I'm heading for? Is that tree going to carry my weight? Huh? Will it get me in the right direction in a three-dimensional world of the orangutans, which is much harder to get to? Will I find trees with water, hopefully not passing by poisonous trees, etc.? So, I actually learned quite a lot from orangutans because the local people and the orangutans and nature itself actually know much more than all the universities that you can get together in the whole developed world. So let's look at energy and biofuel from the forest. And I think that this tree, the sugar palm, the orang pinata, in my case, I had to pay the dowry in the form of six sugar palms 33 years ago. It's now 10 sugar palms. Inflation has struck the area in North Sulawesi as well. Because six palms is enough to help a young family survive. Okay, first, I'd like to take you on a little bit of a lecture academic about the basic issues. People think that modern agriculture, higher efficiency, modified, uh, genetically modified plants are going to be the solution to solve the world food crisis. I don't think so. Modern agriculture is actually wasting resources, is wasting sunlight, and we need to get away from that. And with all the issues we just heard, urbanization is going to happen, so there are wonderful investment opportunities for uh, taking all that increased needs and consumption of people. But cities are like 
sucking up the resources of this world and creating these rings of permanent waste that are not good. We need to keep the local people in jobs in agriculture close to the natural environment where you actually can create balance and stability. And we have to get rid of the fossil sunshine, the coal, the gas, the oil, which were all once plants that decomposed, got compressed, and that we are now burning at a rate as has never been seen before on this planet. And we have to do it in ways that are socially acceptable, ecological, sustainable, as well as being economically interesting. So if you look, where do we need to be to make money? If you look at the basic long-term capital of this world, it's the tropics. Right here, if you go outside, there are no leaves on those trees. They're not doing anything. All that light that is coming down here is just being wasted. Yeah? And the intensity is very low. In the tropics, you have high light intensity. You can use it with better uh, adapted plants. And why should you do agriculture? Because agriculture is wasting energy, is wasting resources. And it's not stable. You deplete soils with it. Uh, but a forest with all these layers can capture light in an optimal way. So where do you have to be if you want to make money? Here, this is the green belt. This is where the green dollars are going to be earned, because that's where you have light, rain, land and people. That's going to be the new Middle East. If you look at monocultures, like oil palms, and compare that with a mixed forest with sugar palms, then you have a much better deal. You don't need the input. You can create 20 times more jobs from a mixed forest like this with better income than you can from sugarcane plantations or from oil palm plantations. And you can keep people working in there much happier, close to their families in their own culture than living uh, far away in those artificial conditions. So this mixed forest is like a natural forest, but every component of it adds value to local people. So you have also not all your eggs in one basket, you have a spread of risk of products. So if you grow corn here, yeah, you can start growing it next month, and then it starts growing up, and maybe in August, then the corn cobs start appearing, and only during six weeks the energy from the leaves is transferred to the corn cobs, and that's your product. What have you done to the other 46 weeks? You've wasted them. If you plant corn in the tropics, you can do it a couple of times. But if you have a forest, you have a huge standing biomass with an even bigger uh, yield that you can harvest on a sustainable year-round basis. So you have constantly that production apparatus in place. So why use the very best land that is needed for food production and put that to energy use? It's a crime. These plants have to grow up the sugar cane. And again, only in the last six weeks, the sugar from the leaves goes to the stems and that's what you harvest. It's not efficient. It's not the right way. If you grow a mixed sugar palm forest on these slopes, you're actually protecting the land, you're regulating the water, you're preventing nutrient loss, you're adding to downstream agriculture, and you don't compete with agricultural land. And actually, by putting up a beam from the slope into the tree crown, you don't even need to climb the tree anymore to harvest it. So you have to look at sustainability from a whole range of issues. And oil palms are about the opposite, as far as you can get, from sugar palms in terms of sustainability and all the negative aspects. So there are choices to be made. And you make the choices based upon the total picture. If you plant a mixed sugar palm forest, obviously, what is going to happen is that those roots that can go down up to 12 meters are going to store carbon in the soil for thousands of years. They're going to improve the water retention capacity yeah, and the nutrient loss will be less. And when it's raining, the water will infiltrate into the soils and there will be less runoff, less flooding, the more groundwater. So the springs will flow year round and people have more security there and soil water levels will come up, which will again increase agricultural production. So forests are quite a good deal. You have to look at the total package of values. 
And the best thing about sugar palms is that they are not using anything that comes from the location itself. All they do is using sunshine, rain and CO2 to produce oxygen and a steady daily supply of sugar. Sugar is made through photosynthesis of the gas carbon dioxide, of which we have enough, of a little bit of rainwater and sunlight. Nothing else. So the forest is now a biophotovoltaic converter that generates energy on a sustainable basis. And it's storing it in the form of sugar. Sugar can be stored for, like the graves of a pharaoh, 6,000 years. Honey is still honey. It doesn't spoil. If your tanker runs on a coral reef, so what? You've got some algae growing and the fish have a bit more fish feed. So it's a much better deal. So with the, all these other products, you are removing organs. And with the organs, you are removing night nutrients. But with sugar palms, you actually add nutrients from deep into the soil to the surface. You improve the system simply by maintaining it. But all others, you have to continuously balance it. So you really should be looking at this kind of comparative analysis. Uh, how much land is needed and how much energy can you get per hectare? How is the water need of this crop that we are planting? Are the pesticides needed? How about species diversity, food security, labor uh, that can be absorbed by it, climate issues? I think looking at this, sugar palms may be a much better deal and a wonderful thing. They only grow in mixed forests. So, wow, no problems, eh? silver bullet. No, not really, because the stuff is so good that it immediately starts fermenting. And that creates a CO2, so you lose your sugar because the microorganisms get to it before you do. So people have to boil that juice with a load of uh, biomass, which is the only available energy source for the developed, uh, developing countries there. And that could, if you have a lot of sugar palms, destroy the environment. But there are ways that you can make the wood of that forest go a long way. And I actually, I'm not going to go in detail, develop the technology that makes it 5.6 times more efficient so that people actually can now process large quantities of the sugar palms. So the basic lesson is there is no silver bullet. You need to look at the package, you look at the systems as nature has given them to us. Let's look at the biofuel. Uh, right now, people already have these legal demands. We're going to have so much in the mix. In Europe, I don't know, 5, 10%. It changes depending upon the policies. Yeah? You have all these subsidies and scheme, and it's already going on. People have already planted millions of hectares of these oil palms and of these uh, sugarcane fields. So what are the options? There are a lot of plants that can produce biodiesel or bioethanol, but the productivity varies an awful lot. And what is more important, what is the total cost? What's the climate cost? What's the social cost? What's the ecological cost? Those need to be taken in account. So in that, I think that, first of all, the sugar palms really stand out in terms of how much energy that they can produce per hectare per year compared to oil palms or to sugarcane, and doing it from a forest, not from a monoculture, from a mixed forest. And uh, there are only 70 producing trees needed per hectare in that mixed forest to achieve 24,000 liters of ethanol per hectare. Now, those studies were done by me. So people say, well, he must be exaggerating this and that. So there were six independent studies done, and all of them said that I was wrong, that the yields should be much higher than what I had given them. And the latest one is actually done by Winrock, a group from the United States, and this was a study because the Dutch government financed the pilot project where we implemented some of my patents for producing this sustainable energy and independently they asked uh, Windrock and Ecofist to do an assessment. 